warm welcome to this episode of The Grounded Conductor with me, Timothy Henty. And this week I want to explore what I mean by the craft of a conductor when it comes to working in a theatre. For our purposes, that means on an opera or a ballet production, although many, if not all, of these issues also apply to musical theatre. By theatre craft, I don't mean a discussion of a Puccini or a Tchaikovsky score. As wonderful as an hour as that would be, we're focusing on the nuts and bolts a conductor needs to know, of who a conductor needs to work with, what needs to happen in the process of building a production, and how a conductor needs to interact with wider issues. In opera, one of the major relationships in the production process is between the stage director and the conductor. In days gone by, this relationship was arguably quite simple. The curtains opened on a traditional set, and the singers would have been directed to act without any particular worry going in the direction of the conductor. W.S. Gilbert, of Gilbert and Sullivan fame, was one of the first directors to advance the thought process of staging. His imagination caught people's attention, and he was the first to introduce the electric light to a production. But... It was arguably Wieland Wagner, grandson of Richard, who took things to a new level by beginning to stage his grandfather's works not in a naturalistic setting, but in a way that explored the deeper psychological elements of his works. This director-led theatre, or Regie Theater, which is now the expectation of most new opera productions, has redefined the discussion between directors and conductors, because it poses the seemingly odd, but often complex question what story is this production actually going to tell? The engagement with that psychology must be our starting point. We have some of the most exciting artists from the opera and ballet world with us on this programme. And I first spoke about Regie Theatre to the internationally renowned conductor and huge driving force in opera today, Sir Antonio Papano. I've been very fortunate to work with um, a number of really... Um, intuitive, inspiring, and well-prepared stage directors. Um, but most of them are interested in working on the subtext. They think of subtext a lot. So, um, you're dealing psychologically with something that's already uh, quite complex, delving into the, the characters, um, delving into the motivations of the characters. And often, um, as in the German concept-driven productions, uh, those kinds of directors will try to tell their own story from the story that is the opera. Um, they often speak in a language which, though very interesting, I find often impenetrable. So I have to try to glean from the conversations with them um, what is their passion, what, is, what are they really trying to say. And I ask them, how do you see that character? Tell, talk to me about the characters. Um, and that <clears throat> starts to form in my mind a way of looking at the score and, in Im and imagining what the stage director imagines. Now, I will, have, of course, have my own um, opinions, shall we say, biases. Um, what you do is you put them all into a pot. I next spoke to Amy Lane, Artistic Director of the Copenhagen Opera Festival. Amy has been a guest opera director across the world, is currently directing her first ring cycle, and for many years held the position of Head Staff Director at the Royal Opera in London. In a previous life, she was a stage manager at the Royal Opera and a trained opera singer, so it's fair to say she knows a little about the operatic world. What does she feel about the role of a conductor in the creation of a new production? So our creative process starts way before we get in the rehearsal room. It starts about two years before. So we go into the designing process. So we decide what the concept for the piece is. What is the concept and what does that mean? Where is it set? What time is it set? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And what, most importantly, is the story that you want to tell? Whose story is it and who are we telling the story for? 
For me, it is absolutely essential, therefore, that your conductor that you'll be working with this, on this piece with is with you from the beginning. Now, I'm not saying that the conductor needs to come into the whole creative process right from, from day one, but once you have your concept, it's really important that the director and conductor can be working from the same kind of set of, of rules and thoughts, really. Now, what's very healthy is when directors and conductors can challenge and move forward the creative process. When you work as a director, you can create as much as you like and you can have a whole world ready to go into the rehearsal room. Now, if when you go into that rehearsal room and you work with your new conductor, they don't agree with that world that you've set up and chosen, oof, that's when it gets a little bit tricky. So I think the most important thing to do is your research before you go into the room. Invite your conductor in. Your conductor is one of the most important parts of your creative team. They need to be behind the concept. Doesn't mean they need to agree with every nut and bolt, but if they can follow the story and they want to present the same drama than you do, then that's when you're making the good stuff. My next guest is award-winning opera director Lawrence Dale. And no, you're not mistaken, he's the same Lawrence Dale that, before his retirement from the stage, was lauded as one of the most gifted operatic tenors of his generation. Now a celebrated opera director, his production in Australia of Handel's Agrippina won the Helpman Award for Best Opera in 2016, and he was also nominated as Best Director. I had the pleasure of conducting his 2015 production of Puccini's Madama Butterfly at the Nederlands Reisopera, and the next year his production of Richard Strauss's Ariadne auf Naxos for the same company won the prestigious Dutch Award for Opera of the Year. What does he feel about the connection between conductor and director? So biology of a situation is really very, very special. And uh, that goes from every part. I mean, from the, from the designer to the, the uh, and especially with the conductor, because the conductor has associated himself and uh, investigated a score profoundly. From the other side, the director has too. And often, uh, like in a marriage, it takes a lot of compromise to, to, to make that happen. And you can go in and out with, not confrontations exactly, but misgivings that somebody has been so persuasive on, on one point and then the conductor says, yes, but I feel this. And the, the director must take a little bit of humble pie and say, well, I see your point. Let's, let's, it's, not a, it's not a compromise in the result because the result must be so convincing. And therefore it's, it's a, a persuasion to get to understand from the other point of view and be committed to it. And that's the difficulty, of course, because it has to be committed. But is the creative process all in the end just between the director and the conductor? What other factors influence the creation of an operatic universe? I th think the one thing that one is li we're leaving out here is the whole uh, aspect of design and how, um, because when people, uh, when most people go uh, to a, an opera performance, they blame, the, they praise or blame the director for everything visual. So they blame the director if they don't like the set. Well, the set is, is made together with a set designer and it's, um, it's supposed to create an environment that allows the story to speak most clearly and uh, in a way cosseting the, the drama, if you like. Um, of course, but a lot of people are very conservative. So it says, if it says this takes place in a dungeon or in a castle or, you know, in the drawing room of, you know, they want to see the drawing room, the castle, they want to see the suits of armor, et cetera, and, uh, and the coat of arms. Um, I think, you know what I'm leading to? I'm leading to that, that, that modern stage production has gotten away from being so... Um, realistic shall we say about the environments and then a lot of directors try to create an emotional or psychological space now <clears throat> i've got music in front of me that's written a hundred uh 200 years ago often and 
I don't think Verdi or Beethoven or Mozart were thinking of psychological spaces per se. But since Freud and since Mahler and since uh, Berg and Schoenberg and that whole thing, I think it's very difficult to turn back and to completely ignore the progression of human understanding of the psyche. Okay, all this to say that I think a conductor, together with his stage director, has to be ready to work not only on, on, on the uh, superficial level, but on a, on, a, on a deeper level. What a director needs from a conductor is backup. Back up in terms of musical knowledge, the way the knowledge can push your creative process even further, and so that you can share the room. I think the best and most successful rehearsal rooms for opera are shared by the director and the conductor. It's not a question of the director getting up and saying, now this is my room, it's our room. What is opera? Opera is music and it is drama and it is the wonderful collision of these two art forms the collision in the middle, that is what opera is. Just listen. Just listen to what they've got to say. And stop saying, I think it would be better if it were. <laughs> and you say, listen to what they say. Concentrate on what they've got to say. And even if you don't understand it, I remember with Joseph Van Damme, he was telling me something. I really didn't understand it. But about 10 years later, I, I suddenly go, ah, that's what he meant. Now I get it. So give yourself the time to reflect on what people say. Don't dismiss it. Be, be humble. The beauty of working with a really good stage director is that inevitably, inevitably, you, if they are musical, they will start almost, I don't want to say conducting, but they'll start um, asking for certain things or, or, or you know, uh, it, trying to influence the, the flow of the music. And I, because I'm so interested in the word, and that's the key thing here, the word and the beauty of the word, its significance and its sound of the word, that I will start stage directing. And you get this kind of cross-pollination, which is a really beautiful, beautiful thing. And it also disarms the soloists because they see that there's an incredible symbiosis between the partners, between the conductor and the stage director. In terms of the person who will ultimately present your show, when the shows go up, it's not the director standing on the podium, it is the conductor. So you must have intelligent, honest and fair discussion and listening is a major part of a director's job too. So to listen, why the score is telling the conductor something different. What have you missed? And that's when you get the interesting stuff too. That's when your ideas can evolve. Believe me, I've, I've worked with, I've been really lucky. I've worked with the conductors all throughout my life. I've worked with Tony Papano a lot at Covent Garden. I, I first worked at Covent Garden actually when I was 15 years old in a year way gone by. Tony and, <laughs> Tony and I have had some interesting discussions about where we didn't quite meet on a, uh, Don Giovanni was a perfect example actually. We had two very different ideas of a particular line for Mazzetto and also a particular motif in the orchestra which Tony very firmly said it is telling us this and I very firmly said but it could also be telling us this. Who knows who won the argument but either way it was we were both right but in the end you need to have that discussion to work out which is most valid for your concept, for the artists, for the conductor, and for the whole piece. Then you're making the good stuff. So, as with any leadership role, being a successful opera conductor means being a keen diplomat and maintaining an objective sense of the room and the psychology of the people within. I will always have an idea of how to how to fix something that I I don't believe is working or I don't believe is correct. I don't just say it's, you know, it's not working. I mean, I, I try to, you know, somehow make, make light of the situation, say, or, or depend on, on the, or 
maybe I just take the director aside and whisper into his ear and we, we talk about it, you know, and, and we look each other in the eyes, you know. It depends on your relationship with the stage director. We're human beings, it's not, and, you know, yes, there are stories of people, you know, almost coming to blows about these kind of things, but not with me, really. I mean, you, you, you're people, and sometimes there's going to be, maybe feelings are going to get hurt because a, a person really believes in a certain idea, but if they're made to see that something is not working, or if you're made to see that what you're doing, if you could just change one aspect of what you're doing, could really help the flow of something, then you know you you give in it's, it's, so i think it's it's using your i think charisma understanding respect above all is the important thing so far we've been talking about the creative process in new productions but the stable diet of an opera company is surely its revivals where the audience's favorite productions are brought back with new casts and new conductors what effect does that have on those involved amy lane so reviving is a strange word already. So a revival is a, a it, it's bringing a production back to life, often with a completely new cast, with a, often with a revival director who ideally has, of course, worked on the production from the beginning, um, but not the original director. So the original director who created the whole concept is often not there because they're making new work. So they have their very, very well-trusted associate directors or a revival directors to come and look after the piece for them. So the conductor most likely won't have been there when the piece was made, won't have heard all the uh, exact psychology coming out of the director's mouth as the piece was created, and will hear a lot of this information about the piece for the first time actually from, from the mouth of somebody other than the original director. So it's tricky. What you want in a revival is to see the production that you know and love. Now, the production that you know and love has very, very specific rules. It is a piece that has cre been created. You must look after the piece that that director created and that that director created with the original conductor too. There are very specific tempos that are set for certain pieces that do not have the uh, flexibility to change because choreography might be set to it or very specific lighting cues or very specific physical moments and beats. What you need, however, is for every single artist coming into that room to discover the piece as their own. So it's not interesting to be told, you come in from stage right, you go to that chair, you pick up this book, you sit down, you read. Why? Why does any of that have to happen? What is the, the psychology and the cause behind it? So the conductor coming in to work on a revival needs to hear the psychology as much as the artists. Is that process really so simple with artistic temperaments around? Lawrence Dale recounts a time when he was reviving an already successful production of his himself. Surely that makes things easier. It's not always plain sailing. Um, sometimes things go very awry. Um, there's one particular example in mind of uh, when I done this show it was a handle opera and um it was a second revival and i arrived in the theater a completely new cast um and a new conductor and the new conductor was sitting we're going through this run through of the material uh putting the staging on and suddenly we get to the next scene and i'm listening to, i'm sitting there and the, the girl has come on stage and suddenly she starts singing another aria and you know, there were all these different choices in Handel because he wrote various editions for various singers. And, and, um, and I said, excuse me, I'm so sorry, but uh, wh why are you singing that aria? I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not in our edition. And uh, I mean, one was a very, this was a very jolly sort of version. And, and the other one was a very plaintive sort of lament. And we had two boxes which moved around and so if the boxes didn't move in the same order they wouldn't be ready for the next scene so you know it's like a domino effect if you not one out of place the whole thing falls to pieces and so it was for a very good reason though uh, to to stick to our plan and you know there was no reason for bringing in another aria but the conductor 
really insisted on it. And, and I said, well, that's all very well, but the whole, we have very few rehearsals to put this together with a complete new team and, and please, please, please help. And he said, no, no, I am conducting Handel. And I said, well, there's another version of Handel, but he was not going to give up on it. And then the soprano sort of started bursting into tears, saying, but I've learned this area. And so in the end, you just think, oh my God. Poor Lawrence. Sounded like his conductor needed a day at the races, or maybe a massage and a cocktail. Things can't always be that bad, though. Sir Antonio Papano. Well, in a way, revival productions are much easier. The rehearsal periods are shorter. Um, you're not creating, really, um, uh, in terms of putting something together uh, with a stage director. But um, a few years back, about 10 years ago, I decided at Covent Garden, after having done about eight years of, done, of doing a lot of new productions in many different kinds of repertoire, I decided that I had to take hold of the revivals, in particular the Italian titles, um, for obvious reasons. But less obvious reasons are that the revivals are the bread and butter of any opera house. And I, I, I came to the realization um, that revivals, if you take care of your revivals, then you're taking care of a huge part of your audience. I'm not saying that we didn't take care of our revivals before, but if the music director steps in and really, you know, puts the, that stamp, I think that's very important. Now, you have less time, less orchestra time, but you can also cut to the chase. You're not deciding how to set up the scenes. You're not deciding, you know, all that is done away with. So you've got time to really focus on the music. Well, that's one side of the opera house, full of loud voices on and off the stage and plenty of drama. No less important is the other side of the house, where exceptional dancers are quieter on stage, but considerably more athletic. I spoke to Benjamin Pope, internationally sought after ballet conductor and former music director of the Royal Ballet of Flanders, and also to Christopher Hampson, a renowned choreographer, but also the artistic director and CEO of Scottish Ballet. You're putting on a new production, you're uh, inventing uh, the steps as you go, but also creating a universe for us to, uh, to, to inhabit. And the music, of course, is a massive part of that. What do you need from the conductor at that point? Um, one word, and that's collaboration. Um, you know, creating a new work is highly collaborative from everyone involved. Um, the choreographer, the dancers, the conductor, the stage manager, the designer. Um, everyone should be serving the work, um, whatever that may be. So recently I created a new production of The Snow Queen. Um, and I worked really closely with our chief conductor um, who was present in lots of the rehearsals when I was creating the production. And that was really important because it's vital that the conductor understands what the work is trying to communicate and what the ambitions of the choreographer are. So that when those decisions between perhaps, you know, a musical choice and a choreographic choice or a production choice come up, the conductor can position themselves where they need to, to best serve the production. So highly collaborative. With a new production, obviously, uh, as conductor, you will have discussed in great depth uh, the musical aspects of the production with not only the choreographer, but with stage management, the artistic director of the company, um, and um, had technical meetings, production meetings, etc. But in the studio, if there's a, a pianist playing or a team of pianists playing for rehearsals, it's really important that they know and that the choreographer and the ballet staff know uh, what are going to be the parameters for the music. So at those early studio rehearsals, it's really important to establish a good relationship 
uh, if you don't already have one, with the, with the ballet staff, who are rehearsal directors, if you like, sometimes acting on behalf of the choreographer, either because he or she's no longer with us, or because they are in another studio working if, if it's a new production. Uh, and it's important that parameters are laid down so that everybody knows what to expect from the music uh, in terms of um, tempo, which is often a primary consideration for, uh, for choreographers, uh, but also to do with uh, phrasing and um, more subtle things so that we, we try and impart things to the pianist so that, uh, so that they turn corners in certain ways. But all this, similar to our operatic discussion, refers to newly choreographed ballets. The jewels in the crown of a classical ballet company, however, are arguably found in their core repertoire pieces, famous scores with time-honoured choreography. Putting on those pieces is not the same challenge as putting on an opera revival. You could have an entirely new stage production of a piece, but still use the original choreography. With the extraordinary development of dance technique, the musical interpretation has had to constantly adapt, which once prompted the conductor Sir Thomas Beecham to ask, what shall it be today, too fast or too slow? I asked Chris Hampson about his experiences of this challenge and working with conductors. That brings a different challenge, doesn't it? Particularly with the history of, of uh, balletic movement and the way that it has been um, choreographed to the music. So if we took something by uh, Petipa, for example, it would have been uh, danced in a slightly different way uh, when it was first brought out. And now, of course, that the technical prowess of the dancer is so advanced these days that perhaps it needs something slightly different from uh, a musician. Do you uh, ever find that to be uh, sort of interesting or frustrating? Have you, uh, have you ever come across problems where uh, th that's been an issue? Yes, loads. Um, and I quite like this challenge um, when it does come up because it forces us within the art form to really look at um, what we're trying to communicate. So take the, you know, the Petipal Tchaikovsky ballets, Beauty, Swan Lake and Nutcracker, you know, any amount of different versions in the world. Um, so when we come to rehearse them, if we take something like Nutcracker, a, tradi a traditional version of Nutcracker, um, you know, it's going to be a marriage between what those, say, principal dancers are trying to create, it's the pas de deux, what um, the conductors wanting to create from the pit, and where does that marry? And I see it as my role as, you know, a rehearsal director or a repetitor or whatever my role is in that situation, and um, to be a mediator. Um, and I love coming back to the idea of what's trying to be communicated by this work, rather than what's the step the dancer trying to do. Um, because often in re-looking at that step, the dancer might find something new in it, rather than dogmatically just asking a conductor to fit in with what's being prescribed rhythmically from the technique. Um, but vice versa, you can often find that happen another way too. The dance was a section partic particularly brisk. Um, that might actually open out a different sound for the conductor too. But I think the health of that dialogue between conductor, dancer, and the person taking rehearsal is absolutely vital. I've seen, as I'm sure you have, Tim, round break out, I've seen terrible things being said between people all over, you know, what is essentially a very small issue. So with the older, more traditional ballets, the classics, if you like, uh, so we're talking the, the Tchaikovsky ballets, uh, Don Q, uh, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, the steps have been established for a long time and athleticism has um, increased, shall we say, in terms of technique on stage so lifts are higher uh, the dancers can physically do things uh, bigger really uh, and and often that means that things take more time um, so as a result the music has got slower so the way I try to approach it is is not from a point of view of 
the technique on stage per se, but thinking about how would I approach this piece if it were a concerto and I was working with um, a particularly uh, eminent soloist who, who wanted to play the piece slightly slower than the norm. How would I, how would I make the, the phrasing work? How would we make the music work? So that's the way I try to approach every ballet score. So it, it isn't to do with uh, slowing down for what's going on on stage. It's finding a new path uh, so that you can play the music uh, as, as beautifully as possible. Something I really try and coach myself and my team um, to step away from is to work with conductors in a way of saying something's too fast or too slow. And I try and encourage um, the teams, I coach them towards talking about dynamics rather than tempo, because it can be such a blunt instrument just dealing in tempo um, or, or what we perceive as tempo. Because often it's just the rhythmic phrasing or it's just that it's, it's a bigger arc that often needs addressing rather than something as specific as that. But with the um, Tchaikovsky works and the Petipa works, you're dealing with over a hundred years of legacy, not just in the score, but in the way it's been coached balletically. And having to undo that is probably one of the greater challenges. So the creative process in either our opera or our ballet is well underway and we've reached the final stage of the rehearsal process where it can be argued that the craft of a conductor, knowing how to manage many different situations at once, is challenged. These are the stage rehearsals which are time constrained and highly expensive. Here the final elements of a production rise or fall. In a stage and piano rehearsal the director is in charge, so what do our directors need from a conductor? Um, what do you need? You need support. We talk about stage and pianos and stage and orchestras, and we talk about stage and pianos being the director's rehearsals and stage and orchestras being the conductor's rehearsals. Because the director and the stage manager run the stage and pianos, and then once you've done those, you hand over entirely to the conductor. The conductor will run the stage and orchestras again hand in hand with the stage manager. Now, a stage management team, depending on the size of the production, is a stage manager who will be in charge of the whole stage and who will know every single element of what is happening. We're talking about things flying in and out. We're talking about scenery going on and off. We're talking about the artists who need to be there. They need to know all the machinery of the piece that you're working on. In a new production, a stage rehearsal, the deputy stage manager is one of the most important people that will help run and produce your performances. So if we think now of the conductor as the captain, he will help you take off, take you all the way through the journey of the opera and help you land. He has a co-pilot or a first officer. So our deputy stage manager is sitting at the desk, we call it the prompt corner. And from this prompt corner, our deputy stage manager is calling everybody to the stage, calling all the lighting cues, calling all the flying cues, everything going up and down scenery on and off, sound cues, all sorts of different cues that make your opera run. Now, in front of the DSM, you'll have two screens, sometimes three, sometimes four. Uh, one of the screens will be a picture of the stage. They can have a clear view of what's going on. The other, the most essential screen that you can have also as a DSM is a close up of the conductor. Stand by light six through eight, row Q1, main out, fast on red. So, we have the conductor on the podium in a larger auditorium. Also, we have screens all over the place where singers can catch views of the conductor. Why is this? It's because the DSMs take a lot of cues from the conductor. So, the moment the conductor gets ready to start the piece, the DSM has stood everybody by and they're waiting to say the all important go. I tell you what I need from a conductor in stage rehearsals, in piano, stage and piano. It's consistency. Um, in a stage and piano, in theory, I as the director would be the boss, except, of course, I bow to the stage management. Mm. Stage management 
is the boss in every moment. So we can all eat humble pie on that one too. <laughs> because there's so much stopping and starting, it's a great opportunity for the conductor, through his assistants often, to give notes to while the singers are waiting for the stage director to finish his, his, his stuff on the stage, with, maybe with the chorus or something. You can go to the singers, remind them of that bit, that bit. So I think those are rehearsals that can be used very cleverly. The one important thing that I, I didn't mention before about rehearsing is that it is very important that when you stop in a piano rehearsal, don't just go and do something else. Don't turn off. Don't start talking to your colleagues. Or um, listen to what the stage director is saying. Go close. Listen, and I, I tell that to the pianists who are also playing. Listen to what's going on, um, because that's incredibly important. If you miss that, you're, you're losing a, a tremendous amount. And I think this is important also when you get to the stage, <clears throat> because certain decisions will be made. If you, don't, if, if you don't hear what's going on, you'll be surprised. All of a sudden, you'll give a cue over there, and the people are, are coming in over there. I know it sounds silly, but you'd be surprised how often it happens. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and so I think it's constant observation, constant concentration. So with a, a stage and piano rehearsal for the ballet, what I'm looking for is that as much of the technical side of the production, as much of the spacing on stage uh, and the nuts and bolts of um, us finding out that the cues all work, uh, the, the practicalities of it, that as much of that is dealt with in the stage and piano rehearsals as is possible, because you want to always bear in mind that having the orchestra in the pit is uh, the time when really you want to be running things. Yes, up until now, the conductor's great ally has been the pianist, who usually knows the score frighteningly well, and who has been the rock of support all the way. A close relationship may have been formed between pianist and conductor in the stage rehearsals, but now they say goodbye, because here the orchestra arrive. The orchestral voice in an opera or ballet is of course a major focus of the composition itself, and the conductor now mostly stands alone in getting it right. gone through a, a decent piano rehearsal period, when I go to that first orchestra alone rehearsal, I'm armed. I, I know every corner of, of that score and how it's going to look and how, it's, how the inflections are going to be and how good, and I can help the orchestra, I can inform the orchestra, I can um, give them cues uh, that, and clues as to what the temperature of each scene will be, what the temperature of each moment. And you know, they're so emotionally intelligent orchestral musicians. They get it so quickly. I don't have to give them a, you know, a lecture. I just say two words to them and they understand. So this is incredibly important. So I, I, I'm building the production through them because I believe <clears throat> the orchestra to be the engine room uh, of, a, of a production.
So it's important to remember that from an orchestra's point of view in a ballet production, they can't hear what's going on on stage in the same way they can in an opera. Uh, they can't um, they can't see the dancers, so it's not always clear why something is happening. And so trying to explain um, what's going on on the stage can be useful, particularly for certain key moments, but getting too specific about uh, why something is at a certain speed because of a technical uh, technical concern or whatever is, in my opinion, not the way to go. It's far better to be talking about character in the music and why um, why it's important that this moment is a, a little grander. Not talking about because there's some something happening on stage at this point that is uh, technically uh, impressive, but think about it in terms of the character of the music and how we want the music to sound. So stage and orchestras, the pressure is on you have maybe two to four stage and orchestras before you get to the general, which is the last rehearsal where kind of all bets are off. It's called a general rehearsal, and yet we often have invited audiences. So how can a conductor help his orchestral rehearsal? I think knowledge of the piece that you are conducting is an obvious statement to make, but what does that mean? That means knowing, for example, if you have to send a chorus off, there's an exit where they all go running off, and 35 seconds later they all come running back on in a different costume, that is about 80 people changing costumes in 35 seconds in the wings. Would it be a good point to stop halfway through that costume change in the stage and orchestra? No, it wouldn't. Always let things like that happen and then stop, because then everybody is rehearsing at the same time, at the same pace, and there is so much to be said for conductors who are aware of costume, of set, of lighting, of technical requirements, of flying requirements, of uh, scene change requirements. Now, it is not their job necessarily to know all of that. The stage manager knows all of that. The stage manager will advise the conductor on where would, uh, where would be a good point to stop. Where do we want to try and get to? But how marvellous it is when conductors have already thought about that, have already got a little extra in, the, in their bag in terms of what would be useful. When we get to the stage and orchestra rehearsals, those rehearsals are mine. I guide them. I decide what I want to do and what I want to achieve. Now, usually, I go for a run-through. They're often quite messy. Mm -hmm. um, we might have had a couple of zits probers. Those are those rehearsals where the singers, there's no staging, but the singers usually seated, sit uh, in front of the orchestra and sing along with the orchestra. And it's a musical coming together, meeting of the minds. If we've had that, then they have an idea of what's going on. But when we get to the stage and orchestras, you get all of a sudden, you get the problems of distance, the, you know, can they hear the orchestra? Can they see me in the positions there? All those kinds of things. And are they acting or are they just staring at me? What do we want from the characters on stage? We want to believe them. We want to believe if it's a love duet, we want to believe they're genuinely falling in love. What happens when there's a third person in that relationship. So who is that person in the love duet? Well, it's suddenly a trio, because there's the conductor. So who is the love duet between? The love duet is between the two artists, probably facing each other. It's between the orchestra also, who will be adding maybe a whole other texture to a love duet. It is also about the conductor. So suddenly a duet becomes pretty crowded. What we ultimately want is the belief of the storytelling between these two people singing a love duet. So, if, for example, I'm going to imagine you, I'm, I'm singing this love duet to you, and oh my goodness, I'm in love, 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 I'm in love. That's not, what are you looking at? Who are you looking at? If that person is constantly doing that to the conductor, do we believe it? It, I don't know whether we do. So brilliant tricks. There's a marvellous thing called peripheral vision. 
I'm very, very tough on singers. You know, don't look at me, you know. Don't look at me, don't look at me. <laughs> Looking at the orchestra, wondering where the hell they are. But I need them to look at me at key points, you know. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Yeah. I, it, it, it's just brilliant. Don't look at me, you know. And he means it. He will follow you. He will push you. He will lead you. He will make sure that everything is going at the same time. That is the trust that you need from a conductor to say, it's okay, don't come and stand down stage center and glue yourself to me. I'm not in the love duet. I'm helping the love duet. I, I drive people crazy that way. But those rehearsals, a run through, as messy as it can be, because it's the first time you go through it, will tell you so much. You'll know then how to rehearse, what needs work, what is working by itself, what is absolutely not working. And you'll also get a sense of balance. You'll have somebody from your music staff uh, sitting in the back of the house who will give you notes about, you know, you're, you're completely drowning out here. We don't hear those instruments here. We don't, you know, all that kind of stuff. And <clears throat> so it's a huge jumble of information, but at least you have the information. It's the ability to um, swim at pace with the time frame that is allotted and and you've alluded to the fact that you know budgets are very tight and we're dealing with large amounts of people often you know 40 to 60 people on stage 60 plus people in the pit plus all the technical support plus all the creatives sitting out front that's a you know that's a lot of people we're trying to manage and the ability to be able to progress that production week or production days in some cases at a pace that's still um, delivering high artistic value is a real balancing act. So when you get to the general rehearsal, hopefully people will sing. You usually have an audience. It's a chance to get a feeling of how the production is going to work in front of an audience. There's still something superficial about it. It's not real. People are not getting paid. But it's a good preparation. Um, usually a dress rehearsal audience is very friendly. Am I still creating at a general rehearsal? Well, it's the first time you have an audience. It's the first time you see what maybe what singers are really going to do. You know. But I have never, ever not been surprised at a first night. I'm, no matter how much... How many notes I give after the general rehearsal, how many, um, uh, how much thinking I've done, how much analyzing in my mind. Um, the first night will always be full of, chock full of surprises. Now back in 2018, I was lucky enough to conduct a new production of Iolanthe by Gilbert and Sullivan for English National Opera at the London Coliseum. But it wasn't quite the same experience described by our guests. I got to work with Cal McChrystal, famed for his comedy direction, his previous credits had included One Man, Two Governors, Paddington Two, he's even in that one, and a much loved Gifford's Circus. This was only his second opera production, but he had a very clear vision of what he wanted to bring into the house. I came armed with thoughts of impenetrable psychology, but Cal brought his own skills to the table. Two years on, I caught up with Cal to reminisce over our experiences of putting on an opera together. And I thought it might be quite nice for us to chat about our process because, of course, when I first met you, we didn't know each other at all, did we? No. No, I, I first met you in, um, in the foyer of the Colosseum, I think. Um, we're with uh, the, the producer, um, Terry Jane. And um, you said, um, I'm a big fan of Mighty Boosh, and I said, you got the job. Yeah. It was as simple as that. Thank you. 
um, I think with any production, you have to think, for me, principally about the audience. And I knew that a, a big proportion of the audience that would come to see Isle Anthony um, would be people who loved the piece and who knew the piece probably better than I did. And so, of course, of course, you have to show the text a lot of respect because I, I know people come and they sit with the score on their lap and they follow it. And so I wanted to make um, a show that, um, that the old guard would love, mm. but that wouldn't be a very a dry kind of academic um, churning out of old ideas. I wanted to make it very fresh as well. And so we kind of cheekily wrote extra gags, but hopefully slightly in a Gilbertian style, mm. but just to get kind of more laughs per minute in there. Mm. Um, but no, I mean, obviously we, we respected the, the, the piece. Because I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not uh, an expert at, uh, at Gilbert and Sullivan at all. And um, I'd done a bit at school. And I remember saying to you before, long before we started rehearsals, can I come over to your place and can we play and sing through the whole thing yeah. and stop every time I've got a question or stop every time you've got a, some juicy bit of information to impart. And we did that over several sessions and it helped me so much because I was nervous about going into an environment where everybody possibly knew more than I did. And yet I was supposed to be the one holding the floor half the time. Um, and you were able to, tell me ah oh, you know this is a this is a Mendelssohn reference and this is this so so by the time we came to start rehearsals I felt I had some kind of a grip on the piece uh, which I wouldn't have had without your your uh, you know patience and, and pedagogy so thank well, you for that well it was vice versa though as well because through those sessions you know we started to get an idea of what universe that was going to be and I sort of felt as if I was, I wasn't going to be disenfranchised by this process at all. I was going to be, yeah, we were going to be a team and uh, and be involved with each other's ideas on something. And I think that's one of the things that I found so magical about the whole process was this great rapport that we had. And that was really set up by us really talking in advance, wasn't it? About uh, the ideas that you had and the way that they were, developing I mean particularly there was one uh, um, duet which involved yes. quite a lot of laughs uh, and we've we've spoken about that in the press before haven't we but maybe we could chat about mm. it now because that took quite a bit of doing didn't it well I remember saying to you and this um, and we have spoken about it before because it's actually a very good example of how we worked and I remember saying look you know this duet is beautiful but it's a bit of a standard kitsch type duet with the girl sitting on a tuffet, the guy on one knee, and they're singing I love you to each other. Mm. And I said, I do want to animate it. There's nothing we can do with the actual music to make it funnier. There's nothing we can do with the, uh, with the lyrics to make it funnier. So I want to put lots of background action. In. So I said to you, which are the bits of this piece of music that you definitely don't want to hear laughter in? And you went through it and said, well, this is, a, this is a cappella, we want to hear that, this is a beautiful harmony, this sustained note, etc, etc. So I basically took all the bits in between and put the laughs there. Yes. Um, 
and it was very funny and it was it was a very irreverent um, part of the show coming quite early on and it sort of told the audience what kind of show it was if you can involve everybody above behind and underneath the stage in the same vision um, you know you're going to make a lot more progress a lot more quickly do you did you feel the same when we were working together that we needed we, we had a lot of technical elements to bring together in our lancy didn't we yes we did and um you and i would uh, you know i remember conferring with you with with various different ideas that i was having in the rehearsal room and i was i, I hope i was careful to always ask if that was all right by you and i remember saying to you um in fact uh after we opened i just said thank you for being so flexible and you said to me thank you for not asking for anything ridiculous uh, yeah. mean, although i did although i did ask for lots of ridiculous things but they weren't things that would that were that were were spoiling the piece at all but you gave such a very clear vision of what you wanted out of that production that um you know we all felt you know as if you were at the helm of of a universe that you'd really sort of inhabited and loved for quite a long time. So I don't think that th there was anything ridiculous about it at all, really. And what you were asking, you asked for in such a well thought out and intelligent way. Um, first saw that um, model and we realized the, the world that you had created, along with the designer, you know, the whole room was just three, like in awe. Well, I think, um, you know, I think that a lot of opera designers seem to feel that they have to go really so far in the other direction from what's in the piece to make to to, to make something original mm. and i think you should never set out to make anything original you should just set out to make something good and then hopefully it will be original and i fought very hard um to not with the designer paul brown uh but with 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 the people at the eno in order to do a traditional looking production mm. because the way my comedy works you have to set the rules out say this is the environment so people think they understand what they're in and then you twist everything and that's where you get the laughs. Cal McChrystal there on bringing his comedy into the world of opera companies. Thank you so much for joining me Timothy Henty on The Grounded Conductor. In conclusion I leave you with the final thoughts from Lawrence Dale and Sir Antonio Papano on what a good opera conductor needs to do. I think an opera conductor has to live the words as much as the music. Um, I think having some training in the languages doesn't hurt. I know myself, I mean, I speak Italian, French, German, English, but those, that's really helpful, you know, for opera. You need to deal with people's uh weaknesses you need to deal with their strengths as well but people are always vulnerable i mean performers are putting themselves out there not only um that you understand what it means but that you understand how a, a language is pronounced what's the flow of what is the flow of each language because if you're condu if you don't know the flow of a language and you're conducting italian opera you're just conducting music you have not a clue about what you're doing been very lucky with some really wonderful conductors who have relished the the time together in a rehearsal room and they carry on the the they carry the flambeau the the, the flame because at the dress rehearsal the director is out the window he can sit there in the premiere getting nervous all the rest of it but it's the conductor who makes it all work and uh, so that trust and confidence and friendship in my opinion that develops within the rehearsal period is uh, what makes the show work and makes it worthwhile.